this is my introductory cartoon today. Um, these are church mice. We'd like to talk to you about cheeses. <laughs> Everybody got that? Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't, I'm a little concerned. So I want to talk to you today about cheeses. A friend of mine in Wisconsin, the land of cheese, um, Bruce, after a messy breakup, decided that it was time for a simple life. And this is a picture that Bruce sent me of his tiny home. He's pulling it to a mutual friend's back 40 acres along Cedar Creek, north of Milwaukee. I grew up in a tiny home. This is my tiny home, 1950s trailer in Mississippi. This is actually my trailer. Um, until age 11, in Pennington Acres trailer quarters I've shared, Boonville, Mississippi, and I did inherit this tiny home, now inhabited by ne my nephew, uh, Jimmy Jr., who's my namesake. Well, and as I was thinking about our reading for today, the sacred reading from Mark, and the message focusing on living simply, I asked Bruce, this friend of mine who is hauling his tiny home, for a brief reflection. And he said, I'm learning now to live a simple life. A life uncluttered by most of the things that people fill their lives with and left with space for what really matters. A life that is in constant busyness and rushing, but contemplation and creation. Connection with people I love and time for nature and activity. He goes on and he says, now that doesn't mean I have zero clutter and zero complications. I'm a part of the world. I'm not a secluded monk. I have possessions, I have electronics, I have distractions, and occasionally I am very busy. But I just have reduced it to make space. I have just reduced it to make space. So from a spiritual perspective, it's all about reducing the stuff around us to make space for the divine or for God or for the God of your own understanding, to make space to connect with God. Who comes to mind when you think of simple living? Who comes to mind? Thoreau? Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa? Buddhist monks? St. Francis, Jesus, Jesus. Shakers. the Shakers. <laughs> the Cheeses. I think that came from Pastor Susan. Susan Pastor Susan said that. What's that? Prince, yes. Immigrants. Anybody else? I think of Mahatma Gandhi in this 1942 picture of him spinning yarn. He believed in a life of simplicity. He believed in a life of self-sufficiency. You know, there are several religions and spiritual traditions that encourage simple living. We've talked about some of them. I do think about John the Baptist who lived very simply in the deserted wilderness. He ate what was there. He foraged for food. He dressed in what was available in the desert. He probably drank from the stream and bathed in the stream. I think of Jesus um, that you mentioned for us. In our reading this morning, Jesus said this to his followers. He encouraged them to be simple on the journey or to find simplicity in the journey. He said, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. And then he goes on to say, Wear sandals, but only one pair, and no extra tunic. Or the more contemporary modern translation that we heard says, don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this, because you are the equipment. No special appeals for funds, stewardship. Keep it simple. Wear one pair of sandals and no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. Well, I am what you might call a defensive packer. I pack for the what ifs. <laughs> Here in our dry desert, when I go hiking or when I take a couple of days off, I usually pack every type of shoe imaginable, 
I bring my woolly shirts, even if I know it's going to be 100 degrees. I take extra, extra, extra sandals. And most of you know I lived in Novosibirsk, Russia, for 18 months. And the plan was to be there for five years, but instead I needed to come back early because my mother had a terminal illness. And what that meant, at least for five years and probably beyond, was that I sold everything. Kind of like Pastor Susan, probably when you went to Africa, and now you return to the States. All of my world need to be squished into two foot lockers about this size. That's all I could take. Now talk about traveling light. Well, that's not as light as Jesus encouraged his disciples to travel, at least by our first world standards. So I sold my three-year-old starter home in Lincoln. I sold my GMC Jimmy, all my furniture, clothing, accoutrements. I stored about 20 boxes of books because those are my most cherished possessions, even to this day. But I was learning to live simply. And for the first month, I lived with a Russian family in one of their spare bedrooms that I shared with one of their children. And then I came back to the United States and I was relocating Jewish Russian immigrants in the Rogers Park area of Chicago and spending evenings at the Chicago Northwestern Hospital where my mother was for months. And I decided at that point I was going to live simply. It took me six months to buy a car. I lived in a tiny little efficiency apartment on the North Shore of Chicago. But I've learned to amp it up. I've learned to gather stuff again and again and again with each move. And here's another word from Jesus. A religious teacher asked Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus responds, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Sobering, isn't it, as you talk about Jesus living the simple life? Many mystics throughout the history of Christianity, in the pursuit of deepening their relationship with God, they found that living simply and letting go of the trappings of the world was a path to the divine. And some of you mentioned different Christian groups, right, that for centuries have practiced in some form or another of not consuming wealth, of not consuming technology, Shakers, Mennonites, the Amish, Hutterites, Amana colonies, if you've been through Iowa, in the cornfields you find the Amana colonies where at least in years gone by they used to live simply. Good old German Baptist brethren still live simply, and of course the Quakers. I think there's a modern mystic by the name of, of Rohr, Richard Rohr, which I know many of you follow, and he said this. The people who know God well are mystics, hermits, prayerful people, those who risk everything to find God, but they always meet a lover, not a dictator. There was another major ancient Greek philosopher who because he wanted to live simply and with great virtue was said to have lived in a wine jar. And this is a picture of that Greek philosopher with a little bit of phoenix in the background. <laughs> I think that's a great juxtaposition, isn't it? So let's get down to the rub, to the major issue to the crux theologorum. <laughs> I'm not a hoarder. Simple living is learning to be satisfied with what one has rather than what one wants. I realize choosing to live simply may also be a matter of my white privilege. Simple living is distinct from those who are forced into poverty that is not a voluntary choice. But choosing to live simply according to research and according to personal experience after I returned from Russia and during my time in Russia and maybe your time in Africa, it improves your spirituality. It improves your health. It increases your quality time for family and friends. It gives balance to your life, to your work life, which I struggle with, and it leads to financial sustainability. And 
Everybody I researched on the issue of living simply said it will reduce your stress. Simple living can sometimes be a response to consumerism, to consumption. Simple living is aligned with environmentalists and anti-consumers and anti-war movements and even tax resistance movements. Live simply so that others may simply live. This has been attributed to Mother Teresa, to Gandhi, to a few others. If you want to attribute it to me, that's absolutely fine. You can <laughs> attribute it to yourself if you'd like. But living simply so that others may simply live. Traveling light as Jesus challenged his disciples over 2,000 years ago, does it make sense in our world today? Carrie, does it make sense? Mm. Anybody else? Does not make sense? I should say amen then. But it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make human sense. There's a potential danger in being a breathing, walking disciple of Jesus in Jesus' day, and there's also a danger in being a breathing, walking disciple today. You see, Jesus was preaching and teaching and living a new way to be. A new way to be in connection with the divine, with God, with his father, with his mother. Jesus' went, way went against all of the religious and political conventions of the day. It was totally counterculture. And as the disciples were sharing this Jesus in a radical way, living and being the kingdom, the dominion of God on earth, that was a dangerous call. We know what happened to Jesus and we honestly know what happened to all the rest of the disciples. I think above all that Jesus was honestly in this whole story calling them to simple living, but also calling them to vulnerability. And that's a really difficult world. You said amen. Thank you. <laughs> vulnerability. Jesus sends out his disciples in utter vulnerability. He sends them out in a state of utter vulnerability. Don't take an extra pair of sandals, but what happens if if the sandal strap comes loose. Don't take an extra tunic, but I've got to wash my clothes. Brene Brown said this, vulnerability is not about weakness. It's about showing up and being seen. Jesus wanted his disciples, his followers, to show up and to be seen in a way that was different from the rest of the world. Sharing Jesus' message of living with less and being in deeper connection to the Creator. That's what Jesus wanted from them. That vulnerability, that simplicity. So the disciples could be heart to heart, mind to mind, and soul to soul. Vulnerability is at the core, the heart, the center of a meaningful human existence. Jesus wanted his disciples, as he wants us as modern day disciples, to have meaningful human and meaningful divine relationships and experiences. We will never reach another human heart without vulnerability, without simplicity. Hearts touching hearts and mind touching minds and spirits touching spirits. Jesus was calling them to a journey I believe, of a simple life of vulnerability. That's what this particular narrative seems to boil down to. So the question for me today is, am I willing, are you willing, are we as community of faith willing to live simple lives of vulnerability? Vulnerability is the cradle of the emotions and experiences that I think we're all craving right now. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love. It's the birthplace of belonging. It's the birthplace of joy. Vulnerability is the birthplace of courage, empathy, and creativity. Vulnerability is actually the birthplace of all the goodness that we have within us. And in the past months, this theme of vulnerability seems to keep finding me. Maybe it's because I was preparing for Pastor Susan to arrive for all the new staff. Maybe it was feeling, well, James, what have you got to lose now? 
Show your true colors. Be your authentic, vulnerable self. Simplify. It found me when I was reading an article a few months by an English theologian by the name of Sarah Coakley. And if you haven't read Sarah, please do. Dr. Sarah, she spoke of prayer as vulnerability. And she wrote this book that I've been reading and preparing for a potential series on God and sexuality, of God's sexuality and the self. And she explains that she was transformed by the practice of prayer. She began to pray specifically for the gifts of simplicity and vulnerability. Simplicity and vulnerability. And she found that as she prayed for simplicity and vulnerability, that she was being called to relinquish control. A few weeks ago, I said, you really can't control anything in life anyway, so why plan? That's probably not really a good plan, <laughs> but it's truthful. We want God in our lives, but in a way that allows us to do the planning, to control the relationships so the relationship with God and others suits us best. In our relationship with God, we're not in control, and honestly, in our relationship with others, we're not in control either because it takes two or three or a village or a community. But there is power in vulnerability and there is power in simplicity. And right now we feel so vulnerable about our future as Americans, as people of faith, as human beings. What is the future gonna hold and who has control over the future? When we can fully embrace and live into vulnerability, then God can work freely in us. God can and will transform our spiritual life in ways that we are incapable of imagining. And I experienced a bit of that this week with our leadership team that I won't say anything else about. I believe in simplicity. I'm not there. I believe in vulnerability. I'm not there. But that's why I'm here to be with you to learn simplicity and learn vulnerability. Now in conclusion, there's an amazing and powerful conclusion to, to Jesus sending his disciples out in this place of vulnerability and simplicity, which I cannot fully comprehend. Jesus says, Jesus says, if you're not welcomed, if you're not listened to, then, then just quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. And then we are told the disciples get on the road and they preach with joyful urgency that life can be what? Did you catch those words? Radically different. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of simple living and vulnerability is, is that life can be radically different. And it says right and left, they sent the demons packing I would like to do that. <laughs> they brought wellness to the sick. They anointed bodies, healing their spirits from the inside out. What an incredibly powerful life they must have been living. Can you imagine going out on the road with joy? It does remind me of some of our Mormon friends as they knock on my door. <laughs> but a joyful urgency that life can be radically different. And isn't that what we all want right now? I want a radically different life. I yearn and I ache. And I want to go on here with an unbridled joy. In fact, I want to leave that life can be and will be radically different. Isn't that what we all seek? Jesus' words always have a way, always have a way of me thinking differently about life. They kind of sneak up on me. They've sneaked up on me for years and they continue to sneak up on me. Instead, I, I wonder sometimes about all of my, my luggage, all of my baggage that seems to get in the way of experiencing joy and experiencing a different radical life that is radically different. What if I lived with more simplicity? What if I lived with more vulnerability? And what if I committed that to you and you committed that to me? What if I don't need to guard all my stuff and I focus on others 
because they are my greatest gift. You are my greatest gift. What if I lived with the sense that I already have everything I need? Would I be better able to share myself with others? What if I lived more simply and authentically, and in doing so, I would find God always waiting and ready to connect in deeper and more powerful ways because I got all that stuff out of the way. Jesus is calling us to go. At the end of our service, that's what we say. Jesus is calling us to travel just a little bit lighter, to figure out this process of letting go, which is different for each of us, and to be more authentic, to be more vulnerable, to be more ourselves in our humanity and our divinity. And I think the message is clear. If we live simply and vulnerably, that we're going to send some demons running, that we're going to see hearts healing, and that we're going to see his lives being changed for the good for God. So this is my final thought for you today. The best things in life aren't things. That's, I think, what Jesus is saying. It's so simple. The best things in life are not things. I have found things never satisfy. 